to introduce today's speaker, we have Professor Matt Condor from the uh, Urban uh, Planning Department. Thank you, Nari, and uh, also uh, I think we should thank Nari for putting this series together. So our uh, speaker is well known to most of you, it's Resh, uh, Professor of Entomology and Environmental Science Policy and Management Department. He's been in Berkeley for nearly 30 years now. How many of you are not 30 years old? <laughs> no one you feel for a long time. Anyway, and in that time, uh, Vincent teaches a lot of classes. Uh, the ones that I know of are Bio 1B, which uh, he takes us out uh, to the creek, and, uh, a sample for insects, do a biological assessment. He teaches aquatic insects, which, uh, like all my students, have taken at one time or another. Uh, also, a seminar on scientific publishing, uh, which sounds quite good. And, in his freshman seminar, which uh, you have a hard time getting into if you're not a freshman, is science in the movies. So, nice to combine a couple of loves there. Vince uh, loves teaching and is very good at it. He's won the Distinguished Teaching Award. And uh, a few years ago, Vince and I had a chance to uh, go to Korea. We were both invited to give uh, talks at a conference there. So if you ever have a chance to uh, take a long trip with Vince, I highly advise it. It's very enjoyable. One word of warning, he sleeps on planes the whole way. <laughs> the time the plane takes off, he lands in, in Seoul. Anyway, but that's how he powers himself along to do all these great things. And uh, it's a pleasure to hear Vince talk about the Mediterranean stream, a topic that he's uh, really pioneered the synthesis and thinking of in the field of body development. You know, it's, it's customary to start off a seminar about how nice it is to be here, but I, I really have to ad admit that it's nice because it, in part it feels like we're all getting back to normal with, with some of the things we're trying to do. But even more, I've seen several students and former students uh, that, are, that are here and several current students that I have, so it's really quite a, quite a nice, nice get-together and colleagues and everything else. Uh, what I want to do is to take the topic of the Mediterranean climate that we live in here, and we live in several parts, uh, and people live in several parts of the world as well, and to look at it as a starting point to think of what this offers and what we can do in terms of using it to ask and to examine some research questions. Uh, I'm going to take a few research projects, some of them that are descriptive, some of which are experimental, and insert them into a framework of describing to you why I think Mediterranean streams are worth studying. And uh, there's plenty of time afterwards for discussion, and I know we have several, uh, real, literally experts that have worked on Mediterranean streams here, so I'm hoping that we'll have uh, quite a good discussion. And if I could have the first slide, please. Uh, scientists typically go back to Aristotle for uh, general is that no that's the wrong one to, for general foundations or introduction to a field you know we can actually do the same thing with Mediterranean climates okay Aristotle when he developed his ideas of climatic zones for the world said that there were three basic climatic zones uh, the only one that was acceptable to live in was the temperate zone, which he considered the zone around the Mediterranean region. That everything else was unsuitable for life. In the north, it was too frigid and stormy, and I'm not sure exactly what he meant, but it was too torrid to live in the south. So, going back over 2,000 years, we have this idea that the Mediterranean climate is the perfect climate. And it's interesting when we, <coughs> when we look at the environmental things that are associated with that because we see, of course, some of the birthplaces of agriculture, some of the uh, development of the great civilizations uh, related to this climate as well. Randy, next one, please. Now, when we talk about Mediterranean-type climates, I want to make sure you get the idea of exactly what I mean by it. Now, the idea of the Mediterranean cli climate obviously came from that original area that Aristotle was talking about, the Mediterranean Sea. 
where the climate has mild rainy winters and hot dry summers. And while we tend to think of it as being the Mediterranean climate, several other parts of the world have this climate as well. Of course, we find it in California, we find it in coastal Chile, we find it in South Africa, and we find it in uh, the western and some of the eastern parts of Australia as well. So it's a climate type that has been superimposed on the, uh, uh, these uh, various continents. Now, if we look at the relative area of these continents in terms of, of which has the predominant uh, Mediterranean uh, landscape, we see that it's the Mediterranean basin predominates, uh, followed by Australia and then California. And in fact, we find in South Africa, this Western Cape area, it's really quite small. It's the area predominantly around Cape Town. The rest of South Africa has a different climate. But we can see that these are really representative in different types of the world. And one of the things that I want to argue in the next hour is that you can take a stream in California and you can find more similarities in the way the stream functions and the way the organisms function in it if you compare the stream in California to a stream in Chile or a stream in Western Australia or a stream in the Cape part of South Africa than if, for example, you compare it to a stream in Washington and Oregon. Okay, that there is a typology that exists, a typology of formed by this climate that makes these areas, as disparate and as far away as they are, more similar than adjacent areas with far different climates. Okay, now, because we have this distinct wet, cool season, followed by a season that is warm and dry, we find that there are two events that occur that determine our aquatic habitat. It's the extreme flooding followed by the extreme drying. That these two events, and one of the things that I'm going to maintain during this, this seminar is that there isn't a habitat that in fact has more extremes in terms of both biotic and abiotic living and non-living effects on the organisms that occur there than this type of an environment. And the reason being because we have the, the extreme stress of floods and the extreme stress of drying. Next one, please. Okay, now, if we look at this in terms of uh, water deficits, we can see that if we look over here to the left in the typical mesic environment where we have uh, precipitation exceeding evaporation, uh, that's really the, the kind of the classic mesic environment where we have floods, episodically we'll have droughts, but it typically has, uh, doesn't have a water deficit. And if we go over to the far right, we find the arid regions. In the arid regions, there is a continual water deficit, okay, because there is such little water flow. If we look at the Mediterranean, and I want to get the idea that there's a continuum extending here from mesic to arid, and that the Mediterranean has drier zones and wetter zones within that range, we have this P to E ratio going towards this idea of that there is a water deficit that's occurring. Now, one of the things that I want to emphasize is that you know, when I talk about the severe biotic and abiotic stresses that this Mediterranean climate experiences, I also want you to think that it's also severe in terms of what it means in terms of human demands on population. For example, this area, the arid area, there's never enough water to do large-scale irrigation. I mean, we have Israel and uh, places like that where they have you know, squeezed every drop out of the available water. But it's the Mediterranean climate, this mixture from mesic to semi-arid, where there is water available certain times of the year, that the water is in extremely high demand. And consequently, what we find is that the availability of water for part of the year makes it, it, makes it maximum, maximally usable and at the same time puts stresses on it for the rest of the year. So that in terms of human stresses on an environment, that I would argue that the Mediterranean climate probably has the greatest human stresses as well. Next, please. Yeah, if we look typically at some hydrographs, and this is, of course, going from uh, left to right. We have San Francisco, Athens in the true Mediterranean region, Valparaiso in Chile, Cape Town in the Cape region, Perth in Australia. We find the same typical pattern. 
there is a, a, a wet season where precipitation occurs followed by a long dry season during which that water deficit occurs. Okay, that's the classic hydrograph that you get in this Mediterranean type climate. Next please. If we look at this in terms of annual variability, we see a very, very interesting pattern. First of all, if we look at that top graph, this is the deviation from the multi-year, uh, multi-annual average rainfall, going from 1975, in this case, to 1995, and this is for Israel. What you would see is that there is tremendous departures from this multi-year annual. Okay, if we look at the hydrograph on the lower case, and this is two years in a row, 1991 versus 1992, you see that we have extremes, that we have extremely, uh, extreme wet years followed by, or extreme, let me rephrase, extreme dry years in 1991 followed by extreme wet years in 1992. So this multi year variability, the annual variability that you see in these Mediterranean climate streams is far greater in terms of, fl of, of flow and discharge than you see in other types of environments as well. Next please. Okay, for example, let's take a typical pattern that we see here, and these are from different sites. This is actually from Disneyland. It's very hard to take a picture of a flood. But Disneyland shows, has in one of their exhibits, a flood going down. We have the first stress Okay, with the rains that come to the, the Bay Area, and Matt as a hydrologist could talk about this, actually the first several inches of rain really don't make any difference. We seem to need to get about a 10 inch buildup before we start having our first major floods. But we have major floods that occur periodically throughout the wet season. We follow that by, next Randy, by the, uh, the dry season, where at the beginning we have still water where we have the transition from lodic environments, fast moving flowing environments, to lentic environments where we have the buildup of uh, running water into more pools that the riffles start to disappear as we see here. And that of course continues with smaller streams when we have small isolated pools rather than more or less continuous pools. And of course the other thing is that we get at the end of the dry season or if there has been a very short wet season, we get the complete drying of the stream bed. So we have stresses. We have flooding where we have extreme abiotic physical stress. We have the formation of a pool where we have extreme biotic stresses because suddenly we go from a system that is disturbance dominated, the typical stream system, to one that now is functioning more like a lake. So it has top-down controls, it has predation, it has competition, features like that providing abiotic stress. Then you go to the next phase when the stream is going completely dry and now you've got severe abiotic stresses. But the two stresses flooding and drying require completely different adaptations to the fauna. So again, getting back to this idea that in terms of aquatic fauna, this is probably the most stressful environment you can imagine. Abiotic, biotic, and then abiotic stresses serially occurring during the course of the year. Next one. Okay, now floods. Floods have really been well studied and there's a whole bunch of things that we could think about that floods do and you probably could add several more to this list. Uh, certainly the scour, and the scour ends up resulting in tremendous movement of sediment and debris and the loss of a good portion of the invertebrate life. Uh, substrate gets redistributed, which is one of the positive things. There's channel morphology changes. There is washing of riparian vegetation and actually removal of encroaching vegetation when the, the floods are severe enough. There's connectivity that's restored after the dry season when we have our pools isolated. And most importantly, we suddenly get this homogenization of water quality that occurs. Uh, that suddenly the mixing is now producing uniform conditions in the water quality that would have been quite different during the, during the, the pre-flood pre season, the end of the dry season. Next one, please. I'll tell you, though, if you think about this, while we know a lot about floods, we don't know much about what drying does. It's not something that's been studied much. Droughts for most of that mesic environment, if we go to that far corner, the far left of where we have those P to E ratios, most of the world is mesic. Drying and droughts occur periodically 
episodically, they're not in a regular sequence, and we haven't studied them as much. So what do droughts do? What are some of the effects that droughts have? Well, for one thing, if you have less water and you still have nutrients coming and you have reduced dilution, okay, so you have a buildup of nutrients. You have, which is a major problem in many parts of the world, particularly when we get into the Mediterranean region itself, we have increased salinity resulting. Okay, that's from a combination of evaporation and, I will mention this later, diversion of water from uh, other freshwater sources. Fine sediments increase in their deposition rate. If you have sediments that are going to be carried in running water and suddenly that water disappears, where do the sediments end up? They end up no longer being suspended and on the bottom. The hyperreic zone, which is extremely important to biologists, I don't know how many of you engineers know what the hyperreic zone is. If you go into a stream and you look at the, of course here's the water column and then the, the substrate is at the bottom, the hyperreic zone is the area extending down in the substrate connecting to the groundwater. The hyperreic zone is an area that's extremely important as a refuge for a lot of aquatic organisms. About 20 years ago, a paper came out showing that fish and aquatic insects in certain areas are distributed a meter down in the stream, a meter down in the substrate among this zone that's called the hyperrios. Okay, hypo meaning under, rios meaning, meaning rivers, the area under the river. The problem with drought is that you lose that connect connectivity with the hyperreic zone as you have drying continuing down and you lose this important refuge that's utilized by a tremendous number of aquatic organisms. Uh, of course during drought and one of the things that we've seen in long term studies is you have encroachment of vegetation into stream channels and in small channels, especially first order channels, that vegetation may never, may never leave. That during severe drought and, uh, and uh, say long dry seasons, you actually have encroachment and you never really get the floods, for example, to wipe the cattails out that occur there. And this, of course, results in increased siltation in these channels uh, following that. And then finally, because of the prolonged drying of banks that you get during the drought, you have an increased erosion. So while this is not a subject that's been studied, you know, one one hundredth of a percent like floods have, we see that the effects of these things can be quite drastic. Next please. Okay, we can go on, and of course this is the big thing for aquatic organisms, is fluctuating oxygen levels. Okay, some of the things are obvious that we get with droughts and, uh, and uh, reduced oxygen. One of them, of course, is the elevated temperature. We all know that water holds less, less oxygen at higher temperatures. But what's most important is the fact that very often, as a, a, a consequence of the riparian zones that we have in Mediterranean climate scene, streams, you have high photosynthesis of algae because you don't have much shading of algae. This high photosynthesis produces a lot of oxygen during the day, but at night there's a tremendous sag because all the organisms that are photosynthesizing and reducing oxygen during the day are using up oxygen at night, and so the oxygen, in fact, goes down even further. And fine, Finally, there is, because of the buildup of microbial respiration, you know, the, the flood occurs and we see all this stuff that looks like soap suds. Okay, those are all byproducts of microbial respiration that build up during our dry season here. All of that ends up increasing the biological oxygen demand. So all those result in reduced oxygen and in greater stress on the organism that are occurring uh, during these drought periods. Next, please. Okay, now you know we all have a way of looking at, uh, at the world uh, and I tend to look at it through the insects that live in the streams and the rivers and the lakes. Um, by the way, I want to uh, mention the four of us, uh, Matt Condolf and myself and Adina Marylander and Jeff Rome have gotten a, um, a National Science Foundation biocomplexity grant and we're having a workshop at uh, Tilden Park on November 5th on Mediterranean streams. And when I say a workshop, it's not going to be the typical, you know, talking heads type workshop. What we're going to do is we're going to go to Tilden Park and we're going <clears> to... <throat> We're going to take turns. How do biologists look at streams? What do we see here? What do we see in terms of the biocomplexity in terms of stream and human interactions? How do hydrologists look at streams from the same perspective? How does a biological conservationist look at streams? And finally, how does a social scientist, Jeff Rahm being a uh, um, the social scientists, you know, how, how, how 
do he and the others uh, you know, tend to look at it. So I want to invite all of you that are, that are interested in this. It's a, a four hour uh, uh, workshop and you know they say there's no free lunch. There is a free lunch. If you come, we'll give you, we'll give you a free lunch. So, so, so we're going to try to do that. But okay, so I actually tend to look at, at uh, uh, rivers and streams through the eyes of the aquatic insects and the other macroinvertebrates, the large invertebrates that live, live here. And actually what we see in this schematic here is a whole bunch of different insects that live in different types of habitats that we see occurring. And what I'm going to do is to talk now in terms of several studies with the point being I want to emphasize how great these systems are for doing studies capitalizing on this type of information. Okay, the first study I'm going to describe to you involves stream macroinvertebrates. What do we see in terms of worldwide looking at aquatic macroinvertebrates in Mediterranean type climates? Okay, first of all, this isn't up there, we see the highest level of endemism in fish and invertebrates of any habitat in Mediterranean type habitats. The rate of endemism, the rate of species that are only found in that one region for both the insects that live in water and the fish that live in water uh, and fish is highest in the Mediterranean region of any of the climatic regions in the world. Okay, but we see a whole bunch of adaptations in the insects and other macroinvertebrates. First of all, because this is a very predictable rainfall pattern, that it always is going to rain starting in October, November, it's always going to go dry starting in April and May, that we find life history features correlated with this weather pattern. So for example, we see that age hatching, both with the macroinvertebrates and with the fish as well, corresponds with these optimal periods when there is water available. We have growth rates that are adjusted for the same pattern as well. We have specialization, which is not something we see much in aquatic insects. Aquatic insects are typically omnivores, but we do see specialization on certain types of algal food resources like cladophora. And I want to say specialization in a general sense. They're still feeding on other things, but they're really tracking the uh, amount of this, this green algae as, because it's a very predictable food source, as soon as the flood stops, it starts growing very fast. And again, a co correlation between the food availability and what life history stages are there. When the food's available is when they're feeding, when the larval stages that are the energy uh, accumulating stages. And this final thing, because I'm going to talk about this again, this the, this trade-off, you know, evolution, there's a lot of ways you can think of evolution. To me, I like to think of it as trade-offs. There are trade-offs in a Mediterranean climate between having adaptations that enable to you to withstand floods, which may move you in one direction in terms of how your body and physiology is adjusting, but you have to also be able to adjust to the drying period so that we have these trade-offs. Is it better to have a trait that helps you resist the floods that you know are going to come every year? Or is it better to have adaptations that are going to enable you to with, re resist the drying? And you're going to see a little later that it's a, it's a mixture of things. It's not one or the other because you have to deal with both. Okay, so let's kind of look at the first study. And this was a pure happenstance study, okay? Where, well, one of the reasons that I, I, I'm interested in aquatic insects is because they're integrators. They're integrators of everything that's occurring in aquatic environments, both below them, the bacteria, the algae, the fungi, and above them. Okay, they're the primary energy transformers. So see, here we see an aquatic insect certainly affecting the algae that occurs here, but ultimately salmon, salamanders, birds, the um, higher vertebrate predators, all these are ultimately linked to this web of this energy transformation that occurs with aquatic insects. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to a really small habitat. Okay, a, a spring that flows on a hillside at Hoplin, California. And a hoplin is up near Cloverdale. It's, UC happens to have a nice field station up there. It's a hot, really dry area during the summer. And we have springs that are flowing out of uh, this environment here. And if we look in these springs, we would find that there's incredibly high densities of a caddisfly 
And this caddis fly with its head cut off at the top is called Gamaga nigric nigricula. That, that's not important. What is important is the fact that this caddis fly reaches densities of about 10,000 per square meter, which is really high for any kind of insect that we see occurring uh, in these kind of areas. It's a spring system, very, very simple, but extremely, uh, extremely high densities. Well, you know, when Matt asked you how, sort of how old all of you were, I'm afraid that I'm gonna have to go back before uh, the majority of you were born to a severe drought that occurred in 1975. I don't know how many of you remember this, but for two years in a row, 1975, 1976, 1976, and 1977, there was virtually no rain at all. Okay, there was virtually no rain at all. We had water rationing, a couple hundred gallons a day, and everybody was really worried that this was gonna be a, uh, a major problem. But of course, as we know from that graph, low water years are extremely common in Mediterranean climates. And if you look at 77, 78, we had kind of a banner rainfall year afterwards, an extremely wet year, one of the, the wettest in history. Then we dropped down to a little more than average and, and so on. But the point is, these two dry years in a row decimated a lot of aquatic habitats. And aquatic habitats that maybe would have gone dry in intermittent areas suddenly went bone dry. And that's what happened to the spring. The spring completely dried up. There was no hyperreic, there was no pools that were left. It completely went dry. Now, next slide, please. What I want to do is to show you, just again, pure luck, um, when I first came to Berkeley, one of the things I decided I was going to do was I was going to go to every research station that Berkeley had in California. And the first one I happened to go to was Hopland. And I actually went back to Hopland every month for a year. I sort of never, still haven't gotten to all the research stations. I, I thought Hopland was such an interesting place. And what I was looking at was I was taking samples out of the spring, basically to get an idea of what the fauna was. And, you know, just, just for the heck of it, you know, if you're just for, out of interest. And what I noticed in the samples that I took is that young larvae, and instar simply is a, a way of aging, very, very small young larvae predominated year round. Now what this tells us is that there's constant recruitment from adults of eggs into the population and constant growth. It's very, very easy to interpret, okay? And that's kind of a classic pattern that we see in permanent stable habitats like the spring. Okay, but what happened at the end of the year? The spring disappeared. It went completely dry. Really, 1977, the spring came back because remember it was a heavy rainfall year. There was nothing in it at all. 1978, uh, it came back searching and digging the stream up. We found two insects. That was it in the whole spring. It wasn't until 1979 that we came back and we saw that in fact the numbers were coming back but that suddenly the life cycle changed. Instead of having young larvae year round, we found that we only had young larvae certain times of the year. We had them, for example, in April and then we had them again in August. And what we had was a shift from a population that was continually growing and continually emerging and continually laying eggs to a population that now had one generation a year with a short period of egg laying, one period of growth, a period of emergence of adults, just like a butterfly, and then egg laying again. So this, there was this drastic shift in age structure. If we look at this in terms of the size classes, we see in, uh, in that top above in 1976, it was very, very skewed to being composed of young individuals. Whereas by the time we got later, and this is now 1981, it's skewed to be composed of old individuals. And this was the, always around the 15th of March. We, always, we call this my lab, the Ides of March study, okay? And if we look at a spring at the, that's near the same place that in fact hadn't gone dry, it was quite a bit, a couple of kilometers away, we find that in fact we still had this original age structure. Well, one of the things that I think we want to think of this as, as being important in terms of looking at Mediterranean climates is that when we have this complete loss of habitat, 
it provides us a chance to look at how recolonization processes go on. And one of the things that I have to admit, I never really thought about it, and the thing that uh, got me looking at it was when we had the major Sacramento spill. If we look at 1976 in terms of what that age structure was, okay, and then we suddenly jump to 82 when it's like this, Okay, we've skipped a couple of years, but it's always in this, this corner. To get back to this original age structure, we end up taking through 1986. In other words, almost 10 years before we develop back to the pre-disturbance age structure. Now, one of the things that's always been uh, kind of a, 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 an accepted truism is that recovery from disturbance in aquatic systems is very rapid. And in fact, within a few years, we were in getting these animals back. But these subtle arrangements of populations may in fact take extremely long periods. And in this case, we're seeing that you didn't actually get back to the population structure. You had pre-severe drought for 10 years. So this, of course, had bearing in terms of recolonization of what would have happened in that Sacramento spill in terms of age structure. We had recolonization occurring within a year, but how long would it take for age structure to return? Well, for the salmon, the estimate was it would probably take about 10 years, which ironically was the same estimate that it took here. Go ahead, Randy. Okay, next one, please. Okay, now, there's all types of other issues around invertebrates, and this is getting into the question of trade-offs. It would make sense that in the spring, okay, when there's still high water, that an animal should move around, in other words, it should be mobile, to take a better chance of getting away from predators, to find places to hide from any late spring floods that would come about, and at the same time, once the floods are down and the algae starts growing, if you're mobile, you can go around and you can eat algae and you have a lot of food available. So the strategy in the spring would be you'd want to be mobile. In the summer, though, you want to think because in the summer we now have this shift. Suddenly, predators are starting to come in. Predators are starting to regulate the system. So you shouldn't be mobile. What you should be is sedentary and maybe even armored. And what do I mean by armored? Be like a caddisfly. It's got a very strong case around you so something can't go and chew you or nibble you. Okay? So this is also a pattern that we see, that there is a shift in the strategy in terms of what organisms are doing in the spring relative to what they're doing in the summer. Okay, now, what I want to do is to take you on an experimental study. And this involves one of the great insects of all times. Now, what, is, what does that look like to you, that slide? What kind of animal? A snail. Looks like a snail. Okay, Linda is exactly just like most of the taxonomists when this animal was first discovered. They thought it was a snail, but they said it was a very unusual snail, a snail that used sand grains to reinforce its case. Well, if you look right down at the bottom here, right on the stone, you see something that gives you a little hint that maybe it's not a snail. You see legs. Not too many snails have legs. What it is, it's an insect, an aquatic insect that makes a case that for all the world looks like a snail. Okay, now this is in fact the numerically dominant grazer or herbivore that occurs in streams in coastal California. It has a wonderful name, Helicocyche borealis. Helicopsyche, meaning knowing that cycle, Borealis, because it supposedly has a world, or a, 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 a transcontinental distribution. Okay, now, one of the things that, uh, that happened a number of years ago, we wanted to look at what the effect of grazing was. That is, of animals grazing on streams in terms of uh, looking at energy flow and energy transfer. And we decided to use Helicopsyche Borealis because it was, you know, tremendously high in density. And we had kind of a real fun project that we would let tiles accumulate uh, algae on the bottom. And we would notice that, uh, you can't see these, but there's a whole bunch of little dots of helicopsyche, in fact, 
feeding on that algae. And then we had a raised platform. Okay, and on this raised platform, because helicocyche can't swim, we eliminated helicocyche. So the idea of producing an elevated platform was you had this lower set of tiles on which algae could grow and grazers could come and feed on the algae. And you had this elevated tile in which algae could grow, but grazers couldn't come and feed on it. So what we were looking at is what's the effect of herbivores on the al algae that's produced. And in a really kind of a famous sequence of slides, up on the top we see uh, some rocks that were produced just to compare these tiles to the rocks. This is how long ago, because tiles are used by everybody now to grow algae. We weren't even sure if they, would, if they were comparable. We had tile, we had al uh, rocks, tiles, and then we had our elevated uh, plate. Now, you know, like a psyche could, could graze freely on the rocks or on the tiles, but on that elevated plate, Helicopsyche was excluded. And remember, Helicopsyche is the numerically dominant grazer. So what we see here is kind of looks like a little dust that's forming on this, this slide. This is after about a week. Okay, now go with the next one. Okay, now, after about a month, it's clear that there's algae that's growing on this slide, and there's no algae that's growing where helicopsyche can, can graze. And we suddenly wait for six weeks, and look at it. We've got a virtual rug of algae growing, and where the helicopsyche is, there's no algae at all. Helicopsyche is basically keeping that algae down. What we were showing with this was really what's turned out to be a very interesting result. Although this algae has incredibly high biomass, incredibly uh, high amount of material and weight, in fact, it's very unproductive. It's mostly senescent cells, it's older cells that really aren't producing a lot of algae, aren't photosynthesizing, very often like old professors, you know, we're senescent, we're just kind of sitting there. Whereas the algae that was growing on these tiles and on these rocks, while it wasn't even visible, was turning over so fast that in fact that's what was producing the energy for the stream. So that what we were showing is that it's not the stuff that's freed from her, her, free of herbivory that's important to the streams in terms of oxygen production, it's the stuff that is being eaten. So this was really kind of a great study. And it got us started for, for years we worked on this. And of course we ended up, I, I'm sure all of you are thinking, well, you know, how do you know you just excluded helicopsyche? How do you know you weren't changing the, uh, the relationship between currents or the relationship between light? So for years we kept on reproving this experiment over and over again, taking it to new places and trying it. But what this did was it started us thinking about annual variability in helicopsyche doing this because we did this for years to years. And one of the things we did was this next set of experiments. In that exclusion, what we were doing was we had all helicopsyche excluded or no helicopsyche excluded. In other words, the raised platform, there was no helicopsyche. The one on the bottom, there was as many helicopsyche as could get on. So what we decided to do, let's set a, do a little cage experiment and let's use these containers where we can put an algae filled tile in here. We can add as many helicopsyche as we want. We can add two or we can add 10 or we can add 20 or 30. And we can look at what kind of a response we got rather than just all or none, how it followed a straight line. So go ahead with the next one. And so what we did was in some containers we put no helicopsyche, in others we put 30, and still in others we put 120. And what we did was we made these floating racks, next one Randy please, uh, oh, well we made these, let me just say, we made these floating racks so we had, you know, dozens of replicates and we put them out and we looked at the response. Well, if you look at the density of helicopsyche that we put in and the uh, as a, uh, first of all, as a function of algae, we saw that, it, that the algae basically followed the same pattern. But what we really found that was the most interesting was this. We saw that as density increased, the mean individual weight decreased. As density increased, the mean individual weight decreased. Now, for ecologists, this is like a light bulb going off. An increase in density, a decrease in weight, a density dependent relationship. Suddenly we're thinking of, wait a second, that looks like competition is occurring. That in other words, in this system, they're competing for something and the logical thing 
to think that they're competing of is food. Okay, so now we really had an interesting thing. Suddenly we've got a biotic interaction that we're demonstrating, competition. And through another series of experiments, in fact, we demonstrated that at high densities, helicopsyche competes for food. Okay, now, how do we relate this to what goes on in Mediterranean climate streams? One of the things that we showed was that, in fact, where this competition is occurring that I described right down here was down here. When the population densities were normally high because it was early in the growth cycle. Down here, helicopsyche are all very small. Eggs are laid here, they're growing, and the wet season hasn't started. This is the dry season. What really would be important to the population is what's going on over here. Let me see where I can, yeah, here, that is at the start of the next generation, you know, when they're getting ready to emerge to lay eggs for the next time. The other thing that we've noticed in streams is that during wet seasons, typically, we may lose 95 to 98 or 99 percent of the population because of floods. If floods are reducing the population, what's the matter is you've got competition here. It doesn't matter at all that the competition would only be important if it affected your production of offspring for the next generation. Okay, so what are we, what's our logic here? We've got competition for food that occurs from here, but normally you've got a wet season that knocks most of the population out, and then the competition stops, and they emerge. But we started to think, what if you didn't have a wet season? that knocked most of the population out? What if you had a dry year where there weren't many floods, the population didn't decrease very much, would in fact competition continue here and maybe even affect the next generation? Suddenly this is a very important question in terms of the future of the population. So what we did was this. We looked, and then this study was done in the 80s. We had uh, studies, long-term studies, so we knew how density of helicopsyche responded to different amounts of rainfall. So during high rainfall years with a lot of floods, densities at the end of the rainy season were low. During low rainfall years when there were not a lot of floods, densities were higher. So what we did was we designed a study where we went back to using our tubs, but we thought in terms of what would the densities be, say, at the end of a wet year? Well, they averaged about being 1,300 per meter squared, okay? That was after a lot of floods, the densities were low. After a dry year, what would they be? Well, they're about 2,500, so they're intermediate levels. But what about if we had a drought year? whether we had no major floods, and we had some in our long-term data record, we see that the densities are about 5,000. So the pattern that we get is if there's no floods, high densities, if there's normal floods, low densities. Let's now take it back to the experiment. Here's the floating racks I wanted to tell you about, where we had dozens of these things, so we were running many, many replicates, and we now look at what what we looked at is under these different density conditions representing different hydrologic regimes, is there a difference in larval mortality? Is there a difference in pupil development? How about the size of the adults? But really, in terms of evolution and ecology, fecundity. Is there a difference in the number of offspring that they're, reprodu they're producing? Okay, let's look at this. Okay, we look at larval mortality between Low densities following floods, intermediate following normal, high following droughts, there's no significant difference. Pupil development, there's no significant difference. They're the same no matter what, uh, what we have. But suddenly, first we have size of adult males. At high densities, the adults are smaller. Size of females, the adults are really smaller at high densities. But probably most important is this, and this is the most important. Number of eggs per female, fecundity. What happens during these drought years is there's such high competition and stress for food 
that they're actually competing for food and the result is the next generation they're producing fewer offspring. So they're actually at a population disadvantage because of the fact that they're competing for food, they produce fewer offspring for the next year. Let's look at this again. Okay, what are the conclusions? Okay, what this study showed was that the spring densities of helicocyte are greatly influenced whether there's floods or whether there's droughts. Okay? Go ahead with the next one. That disturbance reduces competition during most years and only when there's no floods, when the competition, when, when uh, the hydrologic cycles are benign, do we in fact get competition occurring. And this competition has drastic implications for the population. Okay, and fine, under these, for the third, under these benign conditions, that is where there's droughts, the competition extends through most of the larval development, and what that does, it reduces the fitness of the population so that the, what they can contribute to the next generation is in fact significantly reduced. Okay, now, this is one thing that I found the most interesting. We looked at long-term weather records. Okay, and this was for San Francisco. Going back to 1850. And we looked at the type of conditions that would have produced the drought effects with the low, um, few amount of floods that would have affected this population. In other words, that would have reduced the fitness of this population. And we found that over 150 years, five times there were changes in this population that would have resulted from reduced fitness, simply as the result of hydrologic regimes. Okay, now, the interesting thing about that is I remember showing my students this, and I was amazed five times this occurred. And the students were kind of disappointing, thinking, gee, we were hoping there'd be biological interactions and competition, you know, every fifth or every sixth or every seventh year. But I think what this does is the advantage of looking at Mediterranean climates is we can look at questions like this. We can look at evolutionary questions, basic ecological questions about how populations function, how they're affected by abiotic factors. And we, because we can tie it to a long-term record, we can look at these questions over time. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what I want to do is tell you the last story, and this is a, an ongoing story, but again, I hope it'll, it'll uh, kind of show some of the potential for doing research there. This is a little stream north of Lake Berryessa, up by the McLaughlin Mine. Okay, if we look at just, for example, the wet season in uh, uh, 1999, 2000, rain year, we see that, you know, we have uh, periods where there is little, a little bit of rainfall, and I'd actually like Matt to comment on the hydrologic pattern, because as I said, we tend to not see any kind of major stream effects for about, until we get about 10 inches of rainfall occurring, okay, about 25 centimeters of rainfall. Then we start seeing floods, and I think this is what makes modeling Mediterranean type streams so extremely difficult, is because of the fact that the resp response time differs greatly from other type stream systems. And then of course we have these major floods that occur, in this case around January, February. Now, if we look at, again, this is over a uh, roughly a 17 year period, we see there is tremendous variation in rainfall just north of Berryessa. Okay, and this is over an annual cycle where we have normal years that, that are close to the average, below normals that were, were within one standard deviation, and then drought that are two standard, uh, that are more than one standard deviation. And then likewise we have above average in wet years. But you can see that rainfall bounces all over the place. This is annual rainfall. If you look at this in terms of, say from March 1st to April 15th, boy, it is really great. Okay, that's when you really see this tremendous rainfalls where you have years that there's virtually none to years where there's uh, 30 centimeters in that 15 day period. Okay, so this is a, obviously a tremendous effect from year to year. Now, uh, likewise we have air temperature. Okay, we have cold years and we have warm years and these can vary greatly in terms of uh, 1989 being an extremely warm year, 1999 being an extremely cool year. So we've got floods, drought, and temperature all varying annually. Now, 
if we look at this in terms of the numbers of species of macroinvertebrates on the top, we see again the richness of macroinvertebrates that we find in our streams varies all, all over the place. Likewise, if we go to the next slide, the number of individuals, they vary from about 10 to about 1,000 per square foot that we're seeing. So we're looking at a system that is highly variable and isn't responding to anything. Well, if we look at the next cycle, there is a pattern. If we look at the crudest measure of hydrology, rainfall, we can see, in this case, we're always talking about richness, but we're talking about four different rivers here, is the pattern is the same. The more it rains, the fewer species you have. The more it rains, the fewer individuals you have. Okay, so what we're seeing in that other pattern, we're now seeing over a long-term data set as well. Now one of the things that I find really kind of a fascinating question we can start asking experimentally is, okay, we have species traits that organisms have. They have a, certainly a maximum size they reach, they have a length of life of their life cycle, a certain number of potential reproductive cycles, they have a certain type of egg laying and dispersal ability. All of these are species traits. They're what enable them, the adaptations to this environment. Can we see communities that form with certain traits in years that are extremely wet compared to years that are extremely dry? Let's just take a look at one of them. If we look at the maximum body size that can be reached, well, we use something that's called fuzzy coding in this approach. And for example, we would have six classes. The maximum body size may be less than a quarter of a centimeter, or a half to one, or two to four, or this range, or up to four to eight. When we look at body size as a function of wet years and dry years, we see there's a complete difference that during dry years there is community selection for animals that have a small maximum body size. And we don't see that during wet years. So there are these evolutionary trade-offs and we can test them experimentally in Mediterranean climate streams. Okay. Likewise, I mean there's some fascinating questions that I'm just going to allude to. If we look at the number of years that tax occur in these streams, is that we find that roughly, in, this, uh, in a 15 year data set, roughly about 4% occur every year, but suddenly we see about a third of them only showing up once in 15 years. So these systems are running very stochastically in terms of what the occurrence is as well. Things appear and disappear and we never see them again. Maybe this is related to what we see in that cycle with the, with the spring. Okay, so what do I want to do is I, I, I want to kind of give you an idea about how these systems, I think, work in terms of the macroinvertebrates. We have a hydrograph, A and B. A is a wet hydrograph, B is a not wet hydrograph. With A, with that wet hydrograph, what we end up having is a summer assemblage forming late in the summer. Okay, so the interactions among that assemblage are going to be quite different than what we see in B. In B, we have a summer assemblage forming quite earlier because there's not either changes in the community because the floods didn't wipe out all of the winter species or we gradually get a habitat that favors those, those summer species. So I think what we want to think of is that clearly we have winter and spring assemblages in Mediterranean streams, but this winter assemblage is always at the same time where this summer assemblage forms on a sliding scale. Okay, that's kind of the take home message, is that these things, while they have very definite response to floods, if those floods aren't there, they or are ameliorated, the summer assemblage responds quite differently. Okay, I want to end up with just a couple other things, one of which is riparian zones. I know uh, Jeff and several of the others are interested in riparian zones, and these are really f incredible to look at in Mediterranean systems, where they haven't been examined before, Randy. Uh, if we look at the terms of endemism, we can see that about anywhere from uh, 50 to 75 percent of the riparian fauna is, uh, um, is, is endemic in Mediterranean areas. I mean, it's an incredibly high rate of endemism that we see occurring. If we, and that of course follows what we see with invertebrates. The, issue of leaf fall is really important because 
the energy of a stream doesn't come from the sun directly. It comes from the sun as mediated through leaves and the leaves that fall into streams. Several of you in a class right now that, I, I, that know this analogy, but I'll, for those of you that aren't, aquatic insects shred leaves, okay? They break leaves down when they come in. And the reason they do it is very simple. That they don't want the leaves, but they want the algae and the bacteria and the fungi that are growing on the leaves. It's like getting a little kid to eat a cracker. The way to get him to eat a cracker is you put a thin layer of peanut butter on. The child will try to lick the peanut butter off, but to get the peanut butter will eat the whole cracker. Okay, that's exactly why leaves are important in streams. Aquatic insects don't want the leaves, but what they want is the peanut butter, the algae, the bacteria, and fungi that grow on the leaves. So they eat the leaves to get the peanut butter, and that's actually what starts the energy transfer. Okay, what we see is if we look, and there's so few studies that we can draw, draw on, but some patterns are really clear. That leaf litter tends to be incompletely processed in our northern hemisphere Mediterranean type streams than compared to those that are in the, the, uh, the southern hemisphere. Okay, there's, there are differences related to leaf fall and floods that occur in these two systems that are really quite different and really should be looked at, uh, at, at more carefully. Uh, the shredders, the animals that break down leaves, while they're critical in terms of the functioning of streams in mesic areas, in Mediterranean climates, they don't seem to be quite as, as, as essential. We seem to uh, have um, other things that are able to, to, uh, uh, to function as well. And then finally, this issue of fire, fire in Mediterranean streams. Now, Leah Rogers is looking at this in some Sierra streams, but this is something that's really quite interesting, is the recovery of fire. Now, um, what we find with uh, the autochthonous, autochthonous is energy that's from within the system, allochthonous is energy from without. So autochthonous is algae that's produced in the stream, autochthonous, or allochthonous is leaves that fall in. We tend to find a gradient of the importance of allochthonous material versus autochthonous, or leaf fall to algae in Mediterranean type streams that depend on this gradient of aridity that we see occurring there. And I've already told you about this northern hemisphere. We tend to find that leaves are entering the stream either before, the, just before the flooding or at the time of flooding, which means that they don't have a long time to be processed by animals before they're wiped out. Whereas in this, this, the southern hemisphere, we have leaf fall after the floods, so there's a tremendous amount of time for it to be processed and used by organisms. Which means that there should be some fundamental differences between how these streams function in these two areas. Okay, just to finish up, there's a few other things that I wanted to talk about. Because, you know, I mean, all of us are really involved in applied research. Uh, if we look at the size of the population densities in Mediterranean climates, they're enormous. With the exception of Australia, we have incredible densities per square mile. Uh, as ranging from a low in South Africa of 125 per square mile to around 300 per square mile. It's a very, very high population densities. Of course, related to climate and all the amenities and agriculture that, that uh, this climate offers. But there's some wonderful lessons that we can learn from it. For one thing, I think that, I hope I've convinced you that Mediterranean streams are different. But I also want to leave you with some thoughts that I think that in Mediterranean streams, the pollution impacts are probably greater because of the fact that there's reduced dilution and conveyance of pollution. And that the fact is that we're also living with effluent criteria that was not developed for Mediterranean climate streams. They were developed for mesic streams. So that we tend to have much more loading because the criteria are based more on the idea that there is going to be this dilution and flushing through continuous rainfall. Next. Okay, salinity. And again, this is truer in coastal areas than here, and certainly extremely true in the Mediterranean basin because of the typography. We have intrusion of seawater into our coastal streams. We have, by selecting to divert non-saline springs, we increase the salinity amounts even further. Um, what we find is that natural vegetation, once that's removed, is then it's removed very often for agriculture. We're also accumulating soil. And in extreme cases, again in the Mediterranean basin, we see loss of aquatic insects and the soil tolerance 
crustacea basically replacing them. So this is an extremely important thing. And of course, salt tolerant species, we see this occurring continuously in our own Mediterranean climate, that vegetation gets replaced by salt tolerant forms. Okay, finally, and this is one of the, the important things I really want to mention, the issue of competition for water. Okay, that first statement, I mean, that's why we're all living here. Either we were born here and never left, or we came here because of the, all the amenities that the area offers. That it's particularly suitable for human settlement, and we have very high population densities. There is an extremely high demand for fresh water. Uh, certainly, we look in California, and that figure is maybe about 80% is used for, uh, for irrigation agriculture water. And what happens is then because we have the seasonal availability of water, we have further demands on our water supplies for flow regulation. And what ends up we have is kind of an opposite system. We have streams in the Central Valley that should be dry in the summer, but because of diversion and, and uh, um, effluence from, uh, from agricultural drainage, we're in fact keeping these streams permanent year round. So there's a massive changes that take place in these Mediterranean climates because of the shortage of water. Okay, can we have our water and drink it too? Okay, can we have all the amenities of the Mediterranean climate and also have normal streams? Frankly, I don't think we can. We have com severe competition with agriculture during drought years, and virtually agriculture always wins. Uh, the idea of using treated wastewater for recreational uses, that's been kicked around for years. Uh, some countries have tried it, but there certainly are public health considerations. Uh, going back to mosquitoes using it because of the, the higher uh, BODs to uh, bacterial contamination. Uh, to do that, you need very efficient wastewater oper operations as well. Uh, the point, though, that I know some people from environmental health and safety are here, I think places like Strawberry Creek are where we're really going to effectively do restorations. In other words, places that we can ensure that there is going to be continual water because we're not going to have to be competing for other areas. And I think, you know, once you leave the Bay Area and you look in terms of where restoration projects are going on, they're not going on in an area where there's a lot of competition. And Matt could, of course, talk about the CalFed project where that is the ultimate issue, is the amount of water that's available for restoration. So I think that this is really maybe uh, an extreme view, but I think in the future we're going to see more and more of this, this occurring. So, uh, conclusions, uh, this is very important that okay, this first point, if I haven't gotten it across, this is the message of the whole seminar. These ecosystems are unique. They're reflections of the Mediterranean climate. Okay, physically, chemically, biologically shaped by two things. Sequential flooding, followed by drying, followed by flooding, followed by drying. Very, very predictable cycle. The uh, communities are the most stressed imaginable. They experience bi abiotic stress from floods, biotic stress from competition and predation, abiotic stress from drying, biotic, abiotic stresses from flood. It's a continual <coughs> replacement of one stress with the other. Uh, severe competition for water, to me, the I, I think the, the future of these systems as natural, self-sustained systems is really, really questionable. And certainly Strawberry Creek is a wonderful example of this, that rehabilitation is going to succeed where citizen pressure is the greatest. What, would, what do we need? And, and I'm glad there's so many students here because we actually have several future needs. Go ahead with the last one. Is streams in Mediterranean climates in Chile. No one has worked on streams in Chile. As much as we've looked, we haven't found any studies at all about this. Great place to work. In Australia and South Africa, we know a lot about small streams, but we don't know anything about large streams. Uh, nutrient loading, the infects, and spiraling, the retention and release of nutrients by aquatic organisms, never been studied at all in Mediterranean climates, and they should differ. Algal dynamics should differ. Secondary production should differ. Okay, there should be different uh, rates of accumulation. Hyperia communities, this was up, uh, but one of my students actually has just started to work on this and is publishing some work. And in fact, hy Hyperia communities behave completely differently than they do in mesic environments. So, last slide, and this is what I want to leave you with. I mean, this is what we, we, we have. We have streams that basically have cycles of flooding, 
They have cycles of drying, but you know, again, the take-home message or another take-home message, these make great systems to really understand how stream life adjusts to these conditions. Thanks very much. Yes. Uh, you made a good point about the fact that it may not be sustainable and with growth and everything else in these areas that have Mediterranean streams. And you also made a point about the fact that a lot of these annual streams are becoming perennial streams due to the same factor. I'm just wondering, sustainability has to do with public policy and wondering if the Endangered Species Act enters in here. Are there endangered species that are adapted to these ecosystems that might drive us to preserve some of these Mediterranean streams? There we, we have a, an, an expert on salmon that could probably talk about coho much, much better than I could uh, here. Um, we do have some... About the, the types of streams that are... That yes. Wide fluctuations. Yes, that's exactly what, we, we certainly have, first of all, endangered species, we have syncaris, which is the uh, freshwater shrimp that's, that, that, that has ad adapted to those, but probably more than anything is salmon. Frank, would you... The question about is the adaptations of, you know, wh whether these things can be self-sustained. And the point I was making is, is probably not, and he's brought up a good point. Well, how about through the Endangered Species Act? Could they become self-sustaining positions? Are there species there that could drive that? And, and I mentioned that we have an expert on salmon, on coho, in these Mediterranean streams. And so I'm going to let you answer it. I can give uh, one That's Frank Ligon, by the way. From, Matt, do you have any comments about that from what you've seen with CalFed? The uh, Endangered Species Act is why CalFed is happening. And uh, I don't know, in the Central Valley, we have a combination of Mediterranean climate and snow melt runoff. It's very much like uh, the Free Alps of France. We have a snow melt regime superimposed on the Mediterranean climate. the impacts on salmon. The impacts of invertebrates are really great. If you remember right in the beginning I said that what happened is these things have evolved in this high rate of endemicity to have these seasonal cycles where they're 
uh, egg hatching, and, and there's a, a, other fish as well, not, not non-salmonids, non that egg hatching is occurring primarily at the time when water is coming back and maximum food availability. Well, now this is all being protracted. There's, there's you know, shifts almost like to a mesic environment. So in terms of the timing of life cycles to optimize this use, we're really creating perfect habitats for an introduced species to take over. Is actually what we're doing. Uh, along that line, Peter Morales has shown that below dams you have uh, fewer natives and more exotics. Yeah. And again, yeah. you know, the natives are adapting to these extremes and the exotics are not and can take advantage of this more regulated environment. Yeah, because what I was saying about invertebrates really applies to native fish as well. Yes? How do uh, these streams differ from ephemeral streams in temperate or more music environments? Great question. How do these, how do these streams differ from temporal or intermediate? The, it's, it's a very simple answer. These are predictable. Our streams may have a high variability, but they also have high predictability. Those uh, streams and music environments have lower variability, but they also have lower predictability. So something that is occurring every year and, ex and sequentially is occurring there maybe once every 10 or once every 20 years and without any predictable pattern. It's episodic. It's not, it's not a, a, a predictable. So we talk about constancy and predictability. Low constancy, low predictability versus low constancy but high predictability is what we have here. Okay, good, good question. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering um, if you're thought about looking at the streams in, in South Africa that are under Mediterranean climate and comparing them with the adjacent streams that are in South Africa and the rest of Southern Africa that are under a similar type of extreme condition of flooding and drying, but they occur in the opposite seasons where they flood in the um, summertime but are dry in the wintertime. And so they're not under Mediterranean climate, but they're under the same um, abiotic stresses and comparing them with the Mediterranean um, climate streams in just adjacent to that. Yeah, I've had, that's never been done. Do you know of any study that's done? I, most of the, 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 the stream work in South Africa have really spent tremendous amount of, uh, of effort on regulated streams. I mean, that's, that's really the over, overriding research project that they've done down there. The few studies that we've done, like in the uh, Finibos, you know, the kind of their equivalent of Chaparral, have, have, have not been comparative with other, other uh, areas. Jackie King, who uh, did did some studies comparing a variety of different uh, different things, but they were all uh, all regulated streams. They were not none of them were natural streams. Anything else? I have a question. Yes. It's kind of intrigued me that you say that during a drought, severe drought, the population got wiped out. And prior to that, it was having some uniform adult population, and then it comes two years later. So the whole pattern changes. Where does this memory get transferred or lack of memory? How do the new generation know not to reproduce at times or certain rates? How does that happen? So one, of course, what you're saying is observational. Yeah, it's a wonderful question. What, he, what he's pointing out is a very interesting pattern. We have a population that's laying eggs, that's producing adults year round, all of a sudden we shift to a population that has a one generation a year life cycle. Okay, what, what, what can we infer from that or what the cause was? The key to recovery after disturbance is the source of colonists, of recolonists. What was the recolonization source? Was the recolonization source an a individual that was genetically programmed for a one-year life cycle as opposed to, to multi-year life cycle? Or was it the chance of that to have year-round production of adults, you need just a very high density? Remember I told you the density before was about 10,000 per, uh, per meter square. Suddenly it drops to 100 per meter square. Maybe you don't have a high enough density. So it's all, recovery is all related to recolonization. Recolonization may have been from one individual, that one female laying an egg mass, and it took 10 years to it go, to go, or it could have been repeated. We don't know, but we do know that it took 10 years for that population to, to go back to what it was before. Well, 
thank you. Listen, well, let me again invite you to uh, join us at Tilden Park on November 5th from 10 to 2. Uh, it should be very, very interesting to look at uh, a way of looking at, uh, at streams. And again, thanks very much.